You're in the water loop. <laughs> Welcome to Waterloop, the podcast that explores solutions for sustainability and equity in water. I'm the host, Travis Loop. This conversation comes from the Reservoir Center in Washington, D.C., where Waterloop is a media partner. This is episode number 212, 50 Years of Safer Drinking Water. 2024 is the 50th anniversary of the Safe Drinking Water Act, the landmark federal legislation designed to protect public health by regulating the quality of drinking water in the United States. This episode features a discussion with Alan Roberson, Executive Director of the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators. He explores the state of America's drinking water before the enactment of SIDWA, the fundamental changes brought about by the law, and the progress of the past 50 years. Allen highlights how the 1986 and 1996 amendments to SIDWA strengthened regulations and expanded the scope of protections. He also talks about opportunities to improve SIDWA and changes that may shape the next 50 years of drinking water safety. Allen, it's a historic year. 50th anniversary of the Safe Drinking Water Act. I'm sorry I didn't bring any like birthday cake or any cake to this to this podcast. Should have thought about that. But uh, let's start with like the real basics. What is the Safe Drinking Water Act? Sure. Uh, thanks for the invitation to do this. The Safe Drinking Water Act is the national regulation for drinking water mm. across the country, and there are 150,000 public water systems that fall under that. A tremendous number. Now, about 50,000 of those are community water systems. That's where you and I live, people's homes, businesses. Then there are about 17,000 non-transient community water systems. So that might be a factory or a school. It's outside of town and just has its own water system, but people go there every day. Mm. The balance are transit systems like campgrounds and rest stops where people still need to have safety. And that's one of the challenges is that we have such a large number. And of those, 85% are small systems serving less than 3,300 people. There's only about 1,000, just about 2% that serve over 50,000. Those are the systems that have, you know, they have staff, they have some resources. They, they, they just know a little more about what they're doing. Yeah. You get like a, a, a roadside restaurant, their business is the restaurant. Yeah. And so they, yeah, they have a water system, they have to be safe. If you're a mobile home park owner, Again, your business providing affordable housing, but yet you've got a public water system that you've got to meet all these standards. Mm, wow. And what's kind of the, the summary of what the Safe Drinking Water Act does? Yes, it sets these standards for drinking water, but could you just kind of expand on that a little bit? Yeah, it's the framework that developed by EPA that then trickles down to the state to actually run the program. So the, the term they use is primacy, <clears throat> primary enforcement authority. And that's a, so it's called a delegated program. Uh, the states have to set standards that are at least as strict as what EPA develops. And then, and there are some states that that is exactly what they can do, no more, no less. They have to follow exactly the federal mandate. Some do more, but there's a fair number that can just do that. And then it's more than just ensuring compliance with the standards. There's the operator certification program to make sure that the operators are trained for the level of treatment they have at the plants. They also look at distribution systems. You've got lab certifications. You've got capacity development programs, oh. source water assessment programs. And then uh, a big one that came out in the 96 Amendments was a state revolving loan fund. Mm -hmm. Provide affordable low interest loans and grants to systems that, that, that need money for improvement. And right now, how many standards are there for drinking water? It's like 90 something? Yeah, it's 91 or 92, depending on how you count them. <laughs> so I've seen both numbers and it gets into a debate, uh, just a debate on like COLA forms, whether total and E. coli are separate, mm -hmm. but it's in that range. So the other yeah, 90, 91 standards, and that's a high number mm -hmm. if you compare to other programs. So for example, under the Clean Air Act, we think about air is something we all use, you don't have a choice. There are six of priority contaminants for them. So you can see that, that having a higher number carries a burden for everybody. Mm. So um, systems have to test for all 91 or they have to get waivers. Then the states have to manage the waivers, uh, ensure that, that the criteria that granted the monitoring waiver still exists and is appropriate. And so the, you know, there's, there's both this monitoring cost and administrative cost uh, with that high number. Mm. 
And I think that's fine at this point, but I do think there's some thought on if, as we go forward in the future, how we make sure that we're regulating the things that need to be regulated the most. Mm, sure. you know, it's not the quantity of the regulations, it's the quality of them, mm. that we're, we're addressing the most important constituents. Okay. I won't ask you to list all 91 <laughs> contaminants right now. Um, Thank you. We'll, we'll leave that aside. Let's, let's go back in time here, uh, before the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, could you talk about what water, drinking water was like in America, kind of that, that history, if you will, and especially what led to this law? I think there were two events in the early 1900s that I, are interesting that really is when drinking water treatment started to shift. The first one is what's known as the Common Cup from 1912. And back in the days when the railroads were traveling between the states, you had interstate railroads, they used to have a tin cup hanging from a chain from a, a, a small water tank, and they found that was a great way to spread disease. So 1912, they banned the Common Cup, and that actually was the genesis for Dixie Cup. So if you go and look at the Dixie Cup website, they'll talk about uh, how the paper cup was part of the elimination of waterborne disease uh, in, uh, in the early 1900s. The second part of that was chlorination of drinking water. That uh, Jersey City was the first city to start chlorination, and I don't know the year exactly, but in that decade, it became ubiquitous in the surface water systems across the U.S. And that was really developed by the water systems themselves. It wasn't part of, uh, there wasn't a regulatory framework at the time, but the, the leaders, uh, people like uh, 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 George Warren Fuller and some of these people that are talked about able woman realized it was important to do that and the systems adopted it. Then the second phase after those, those two events was the public health standards. Uh, the first one started in, 1914, I have to look at my notes okay. occasionally for the, all these dates. And those were more like guidelines. So states had the option to make them either guidelines at their level or make them the standards. Those were revised four times between 1925 and 1962. The 1962 were probably the most comprehensive. They addressed uh, 28 constituents and every state adopted that either as a standard or as a guideline. So that was really kind of the evolution from uh, chlorination where the systems were kind of doing it on their own uh, volition because they knew it was the right thing to do. Oh. And then the, the public health standards. And what we saw in that time frame was waterborne disease disappeared, uh, cholera, uh, a lot of the issues that they had in the early 1900s uh, completely disappeared. Oh. And so that a lot of progress was made in that time frame. Yeah, it's, it's amazing because like it really wasn't that long ago, right, that you had waterborne disease in the in the U.S., just 100 years or, or whatever it is, right? And chlorine, the chlorination of, of drinking water is like widely recognized as one of the biggest public health advancements of, you know, our time, if That's you right. will, right? The, was that the 20th century back then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. It re it's recognized by CDC as one of the top 10 public health achievements like vaccines and things along that line. So like the 60s and 70s were really the rise of, of kind of the environmental movement and the realization of the need to, to set more standards and regulate things. You have EPA getting established and then the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, then the Safe Drinking Water Act. I know on the Clean Water Act side, when this happened, there is the big infusion of money, the construction of all these treatment plants. Um, when the Safe Drinking Water Act was passed, same, same kind of thing, what, what really happened in that moment? Well, uh, unfortunately, money wasn't a part of it. Mm. But what they did change was the regulatory framework. So instead of the public health standards being used by the states either as guidelines or standards, they were now enforceable standards. And again, the states had to develop standards as strict as the federal regulations to maintain primacy and enforcement authority, mm -hmm. primary enforcement authority. And so that was the big shift is sort of, you know, being a little more voluntary uh, in some states to being everybody had to meet these standards. Mm -hmm. And then from that, there was a process in the law to figure out what contaminants uh, needed to be regulated in a process to determine what the appropriate number would be. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened in the, in the 1974 Drinking Water Act. So again, uh, in some cases, the states had to 
beef up their program substantially? I was going to say that states probably had to set up or even set up programs. Right. They and, hire employees and they had to, you know, you had to have an enforcement branch. You had to have uh, uh, compliance rule managers. Uh, uh, they started inspecting systems, yeah. not just looking at the data that came in in paper, but actually physically going and doing field inspections. Yeah. And so that was kind of the evolution in drinking water that came out of that environmental movement in the 70s. And you know, you've mentioned, referenced amendments a couple of times, right? And yeah. see, so the 1986 amendments uh, came first. What, what spurred those? What were those amendments? I think the issue there is that in the environmental community, they were frustrated with EPA in the pace of regulations. So again, you know, if you think about the mindset that the number of regulations, the number of contaminants that are regulated is, is important, EPA was slow in the number of contaminants that got regulated between 74 and 86. And what came out of the 86 amendments is what I call the regulatory treadmill. EPA was required to regulate uh, 85 contaminants in the first five years, and then 25 new contaminants every three years thereafter. So today, if we had had that same treadmill in 2024, we'd have 408 contaminants regulated. Wow. Yeah, 408. I'm not even so, sure we have, I'm, I know we don't have approved methods for 408. So what happened then to that, that dictated pace? Well, EPA couldn't make the schedule. Yeah. They didn't have the resources, they did the best they can, but it was just way too aggressive. Hmm. And so they, they couldn't meet that schedule. They were sued by environmental advocates. They'd reset the deadlines. They had missed those deadlines and the cycle would start over again. And so this is about when I started in the water sector, it was in 1991, when there was this back and forth on, you know, here's our set of deadlines for this, we'd miss it, they'd go back to court, negotiate, and they'd reset the deadlines. So it was a bit of a zoo, oh. you know, coming in. Uh, I started at the American Water Works Association in DC in 1991, and that's right when surface water treatment rule, total chlorofluorine rule had just come out, uh, phase two regulation came out, lead and copper rule came out, the original lead and copper rule. And so there was a lot of progress being made, but not enough to meet these deadlines. And so the water sector, both the, the water systems and EPA, because they were missing the deadlines, and people on Capitol Hill kind of pointed that way. because that's, <laughs> that's, that's where we're sitting here, exactly. the Reservoir Center in DC. Yeah. Yeah. Reservoir Center is just south of the Capitol. And they realized that this treadmill wasn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so they worked on amendments for a while. It takes a while, even with bipartisanship, to go through a major set of amendments. Really, it took about a four-year window, two, two, two year sessions of Congress to get it passed in 1996. Mm. All right, and then those 96 amendments, could you just elaborate there further on what, what those really changed, how those, yeah. those settled down the zoo in some way? Yeah, I always say that there's four major components of the 96 amendments. And uh, again, I could do an hour on these, but we're not gonna do that today. <laughs> Quick summary, there's four components. The first is a new standard setting process that was more targeted. And it set up a process of a contaminant candidate list, uh, criteria for regulatory determinations, um, a process for saying, yeah, we need to regulate these because they're a problem. No, we're not finding these, and uh, so we don't need a national regulation. Then they had uh, components for cost-benefit analysis in there, as well as uh, every six years to go back and look at all the existing regulations, see if there's any new health effects data, uh, new occurrence data, new treatment that would warrant revising an existing reg. So they really just totally reformulated the standard setting process from what it was in 86. The second part was a series of priority regulations. Uh, these were regulations that in the 96 amendments had specific deadlines like the microbial disinfection byproduct cluster, uh, arsenic, and, and others. So that set deadlines. And the outgrowth of that was between 96 and 2006, we had nine major regulations get finalized. So get, being in the weeds of those uh, with the negotiated rulemakings for the disinfection byproducts, the revised arsenic reg, the revised radionuclides reg, it was a bit of a zoo, just as, as those all rolled out in that first decade after the act. The next piece was a funding mechanism. Uh, the state programs that included the state revolving loan fund, uh, source water assessment programs, capacity development programs. Capacity doesn't mean treatment capacity at water systems. It means ensuring the systems have technical, managerial, and financial mm -hmm. expertise 
to be able to run and manage the systems and make them sustainable. And then finally, there was a focus on public information where the Consumer Conference Report came out on that. Uh, EPA had to revise the public notification rule, and they also have to do a national compliance assessment every oh. year. So all those are in place. Uh, they've all had kind of hiccups and some revisions, but uh, ha have worked out pretty well. So we now have a funding source with the state revolving fund. Uh, people can find out through the CCR where their water comes from, how it's treated, what's found there. So there's a, been a, a lot of things that have come out of that, but it's really those four categories I think are main components of the 96th Amendment. Mm. Yeah, that, that funding stream is huge. It's huge. You know, right? You've got utilities that need to meet a certain standard, put up in a certain program, build a, build a plant, whatever it is, and uh, you need the dollars to do that. So Yeah, and that money revolves. You know, a lot of it is low interest loans, so it's been around for a long time. So as loans get paid back, that can then get reloaned again, and states, you know, they're, they're putting matches in, they're selling bonds, they're doing different things to try and maximize that finance. So even though there's an annual capitalization grant, these funds have really grown as they've evolved over the years. How many new contaminants have been added since 1996? None is a short answer. That right now we're rating on the final regulations for PFO and PFOS and possibly others through a hazard index. So there's been nothing new. Oh. Um, from my point of view, that is, a, that is a, a, both a problem and a success story. Oh. It's a success because we're not regulating things that don't need to be regulated. Because we have current standards where they've never been found in the drinking water. And yet you can't take them off the books because of the anti-backsliding provision in the 96 amendments. Oh. So what we've also seen is a challenge in removing things from the contaminant candidate list where they've done monitoring for it under UCMR and not found it. So EPA would take political heat for taking those off, but yet it doesn't make any sense to have national regulation when you've done UCMR and you found it once nationally across the country. So I think to me, it's as important to make negative determinations and, and not develop a reg as it is to make a positive determination and move forward. That being said, the process does need to be streamlined. Mm. You know, 20 years, and for the 96 Amendments, more than 20 years, we still don't have anything that's not, I don't think that was the way it was envisioned mm. when they wrote the act in 96, or yeah. actually in the early 90s. Yeah, it's all, that, I asked you about that because it's always something that just jumps out to me. 28 going on three decades now since yeah. those amendments, yeah. no new contaminants. Again, that doesn't mean that something's being missed, but it's just kind of, it's stunning when you think about it, right. you know. The other challenge with that is that the states are having to set their own standards. And PFAS is a good example where um, it used to be a couple states, California, Massachusetts, maybe New York, New Jersey, they might set their own standards. What we found with PFAS over the last five years is that almost a dozen states have had to move forward because either their public demands it or their legislature gives them a mandate. Mm. And so states that have never set their own standards have had to figure out that process and do it on their own. Mm. Uh, this is a, maybe a tough question. How would you summarize then how America's drinking water has changed over the past 50 years, you know, from where we were in 74 till now in 2024? I think it's improved substantially for a lot of reasons. I think we talked about the money. Mm -hmm. So the SRF, uh, I, I wish I had the stats on the number of systems and the number of loans, but it's a tremendous number of loans for a large number of systems. And a lot of them are the small systems that didn't have access to like the bond market or whatever and have substantially changed. I personally worked at a system here about 70 miles from here that sort of had 85 connections and was really falling apart and had a combination of state revolving loan and grants uh, USDA grants, some uh, RCAP money to try and, and rebuild the system. Mm -hmm. And it kind of took a village of people and organizations to make that work. I was just doing some volunteer work as a pro bono engineer. And and seeing that system from what it was to where it is today was, it was, was fulfilling to me. And so there are thousands of systems where that's happened. I think the fact that we regulate either 91 or 92 is a big jump up from the public health standards. I think the Public information getting out has its pros and cons. Uh, people know more about their water. They're demanding more. They're demanding you know, higher quality because they have the knowledge they didn't have. 
I don't know what your experience with, with PFAS was, but you know, mine started about 15 years ago. I thought it was just gonna be at the major manufacturing facilities. Mm. You know, 3M, you know, DuPont, now Camores, but I had no idea about the firefighting foams, no idea about the uh, clothing manufacturers or furniture manufacturers, carpet manufacturers, all these other sources that are out there. And so I was, that's what we knew at the time, but the knowledge evolved. And so I think that's one thing that the law does allow for is the evolution of knowledge to influence the regulatory development process. Uh, you've, you've touched on some of these things, ways that the law could be more effective or the implementation of it could be more effective um, or something could be changed, uh, which is a tough proposition to change laws these days. But what are your, what are your thoughts on, on maybe some key improvements that could be made, however that is? I think there's a few things. I'd start off with resources. Mm. And, and one of the challenges we have is when you talk about resources, they talk about, everyone assumes we're gonna go to the federal government and get you know, more money from the feds. And as you just talked about, that's a real challenge today. We're operating today under continuing resolution of the federal government. It's unclear whether they're gonna have any kind of appropriations completed by the end of the fiscal year. So I think it's, 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 it's the, thought, the mindset of the sector of how do we start getting resources, money from every source possible, from the federal government, from state government, from increased water rates with some assistance programs for low-income people. So I think it's all hands on deck. And I think it's also not just resources for infrastructure, but resources for people. So what we're seeing now is a, a, a workforce issue. And you hear about it usually primarily from like the water systems and water operators, and that's important. We do need to have a, a cadre of trained operators, but it really is across the board. It's at EPA, it's at the state agencies. Um, mm -hmm. Consulting engineers are doing okay, but it's very competitive to hire qualified people. Uh, my state agencies are having real struggles uh, with hiring because you have to find people that want some public service mentality and say, hey, I'll take a maybe a slightly lower paying job to feel like that I'm really doing good and and get some state benefits, mm -hmm. you know, a pension or whatever. And so I think thinking about how to invest in, in the people in addition to the infrastructure is also very important. I think the other thing that I mentioned before, I'll expand on a little bit, is streamlining the regulatory process. Let me back up a little bit. Resources. That needs to go to EPA on just research and risk assessment. They're doing okay really on like treatment research and we're getting that from universities. But where we're really struggling is with risk assessments. Mm. If you think about the 91, 92 that we've regulated and the 100 plus that are on CCL, mm. you need to figure out the half a dozen maybe where you need a current up-to-date risk assessment. The problem is that's taking a decade or maybe more to come out of EPA. And if you've got some old standards like arsenic or nitrate, let's take a look at them. Those are still problems, even those, those regs date back to 2000 and 1991. Nitrate was regulated in 1991, has not been updated because we don't have an updated risk assessment. It's in process. Is that, a, is that a staffing resource funding yes. issue? Yes, okay. it's staffing and resources. EPA can do this. They need the staffing and the resources to do it and they need to have it be made a priority. Mm. So you can, and I can give you a list of contaminants that are like that. We're waiting on hexavalent chromium, 1,4-dioxane, uh, lithium. So there are a lot where it's like, you know, we need some answers in a timely manner. So I think that is actually a log jam. When you have a contaminant candidate list that's over 100, it's hard to set priorities. I think that list needs to be 20 something. Mm. And then of that, you say, these five, we've got to really, make a significant effort to f make a decision one way or the other. Because there's not many, I can't name 15 that we need to think about. Mm. It's a handful, mm. but let's focus on those and, and try and at least get some new regulations out the door that address these important issues so we can get away from, well, the law's not working because nothing's come out of it. The law's not working because we don't have the right resources. Been hearing about hexavalent chromium and 1,4-dioxane for a while. Exactly. Yeah. Hexavalent chromium goes back to the late 90s with Aaron Brockovich. Right. 
And so we still don't have that question resolved for chlorate. I mean, there's mm. a bunch of chlorate, them yes. where, where things that we talked about in the late 90s and the zeros are still being debated today. Mm. And I think that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, crystal ball time, kind of last question here. Uh, you know, 50 years from now, uh, what do you think drinking water in America is going to look like? How might the Safe Drinking Water Act evolve on its, you know, by its hundredth anniversary? I, this is a real crystal ball question, I realize. Yeah, I have a few thoughts on that. I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think one thing that'd be helpful for people to look at is I'll make a plug for my previous employer, the American Water Works Association. They did a collective effort last year called Water 2050. And they had um, four or five reports where they brought people together to talk about uh, technology, governance, finances. The governance group actually met here uh, last year. And those reports are a, a big look forward. And so you can go to the website and find them, and I encourage everyone to take a look at those and then think about what's actionable. And, I, and I'll have to also put in a plug here. I did a podcast on Water 2050 with a number of those people so they can look back in the Waterloop archives and find that. Hey, hey I, there we go. We've got our- A double got plug. Our, there we Nothing go. Nothing <laughs> But yeah, and there were some, I mean, some of the leaders in the water sector, you know, very, very smart people that have been around for a while. Um, a, a friend and colleague, Joe Jackangelo mm. from Stantec, he hypothesizes we may have uh, small undersink treatment devices that are automated and has sensors that, oh, we need to replace this. It sends something to the utility and they come in and do that. Because you still have to have the larger volumes of water for the shower, the washing machine, fire protection. Mm. You know, if you know anything about water system design, fire protection is the driver for how big the tanks are, how big the pipes are, what kind of flows you have throughout the system. So I think they provide some things to think about. And really, in my mind, how do you start chopping that up in the bins hmm. the next five years, five to 10 years, 10 to 15 years? I think data is going to drive a lot of things. Hmm. I think that I'm seeing promise on things like the digital twin for evaluating treatment. Maybe you don't have to do pilots. You can do bench scale testing, do it in form of digital twin to test different kinds of treatment. Um, I mean, if you really wanna do what I call blue sky and fern thinking, think about using artificial intelligence to draft a drinking water regulation. And it'd be a draft, because if you've ever used any of these tools, they're a good starting point, mm -hmm. but you need the human factor to, does it pass the laugh test? Uh, to your big point, that's what's going to kind of overlay on drinking water in America is yeah. technology, yeah. I think, is, whether it's data, digital twins, Treatment automation, sensor. Exactly. It's going to probably be one of the biggest changing forces. That's right. And yeah. it's hard, again, being that I'm a little old school and, and again, started off with punch cards, uh, I, but I can foresee the changes, again, going from, mm. you know, even just flip phones to this little computer <laughs> in my pocket now. It's hard to imagine what it'd be like in 50 years. Yeah. Uh, well, good. Alan, uh, so much information in this conversation. I really appreciate sitting down with you. Thank you. Yeah, it was great chatting with you. Waterloo. Thank you for listening to the podcast, which featured a conversation from the Reservoir Center in Washington, D.C. To find all episodes, sign up for email updates, and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org. You're in the Waterloop. Waterloop.